Awesome. Hi, everybody. <laughs> uh, I'm Evan. I know some of you. Um, for those of you who don't know me, um, I'd just like to start off by saying I am a white male born into unearned privileges. Right? Um, I have privileges afforded to me that are not equally distributed amongst the human population. Um, I live in the occupied territories of the Western United States of America. Um, I think that this foundational understanding of where we are is important to recognize who we are and, um, and how we can move forward in trying to proliferate life and beauty on this planet and in the regions in which we live. So, that being said, um, currently I reside uh, up in southern Oregon um, in a small area called Williams, um, but I spent four years living down here in southern Arizona, southeastern Arizona. I was brought into this community to manage the native seed search farm where I spent three years. It was a phenomenal introduction into desert uh, life, um, working with an absolutely amazing collection of uh, crop diversity from about 40 different traditional um, farming communities from throughout the southwest and northwest Mexico. Um, I've been farming for about 10 years, um, mostly in desert and arid lands. Um, but coming down here, water scarcity was definitely brought to the forefront um, and realizing that the amount of water actually necessary to perform agriculture is substantial. Right? To put an inch across an acre takes about uh, 26,000 gallons of water. Um, people are farming up around the Phoenix area with about four acre feet of water. It's about a million gallons of water. Agriculture represents the highest water consumption um, of any human activity and agriculture also sits at the forefront um, as the most destructive practice of humankind. That being said, it also has the potential to be one of the most creative practices of humankind as the conscious planting of seed in conditions under which those seeds may thrive, right, uh, has the opportunity to be incredibly creative. Um, I'd like to start off by saying that um, some of you may be aware of this, but uh, organic and sustainable are by no means synonyms. Okay, just because you are not using chemical fertilizers, insecticides, um, you know, biocides of other sorts, fungicides, herbicides, viricides, so on and so forth, does not imply that your practice is sustainable. Right? The idea of sustainable um, implies that the system and the overall health and integrity of not just the farm system, but the greater ecological system from the region that surrounds us um, is actually becoming more creative, more biologically diverse, ideally. We even take that further to speak to regenerative, right? that we're continually increasing the amount of biodiversity within a region. Biodiversity breeds resiliency within systems, and ideally that's what we're going for. We're trying to create resilient human systems here on planet Earth. Um, at least that's what I'm passionate about. Um, I've got my notes here and I'm a little bit nervous though. But, um, so, um, being down here in the desert and with those questions of water use for agricultural purposes, um, I began to just question why we're using so much water, if there's ways to use less water also. <coughs> Um, working at the Native Seed Search Farm, even though we're growing some of the most drought tolerant, heat adapted uh, crops known to mankind, right, which are a byproduct of literally thousands of years of agriculture ongoing, specifically in this area also, um, adapted to this desert climate. Um, the, even though we're growing these drought tolerant crops, it does not necessarily, um, I'm sorry, uh, that just because we're growing drought tolerant crops does not necessarily mean that we're not using substantial amounts of water. I found myself actually being probably the highest water user in the entire valley, irrigating uh, 35 acres um, just north of here. So um, I'd also like to say that um, what we're working on with dry farming practices and dry farming experimentation, you know, we're by no means pioneers. Like I said, we're sitting on top of an absolutely amazing agricultural heritage of thousands and thousands of years. Um, that being said, uh, traditional agriculture and sustainable agriculture are also not synonyms, too. So, uh, a few years ago, um, I had the wonderful opportunity, as I said, to be working and managing the native seed search farm and began to observe plants outside of the farm or in the tractor paths or on the roads 
um, growing under conditions that I would, are completely counterintuitive to everything that I would think that plants would require to be able to grow. Had wheat fields that we were irrigating and off the edge of the wheat fields, you know, 50 feet off, you also had wheat plants that were growing and just as healthy and just as strong and just as large um, in seemingly degraded, compacted soils. This phenomenon I've seen all over the world where I've traveled. I've traveled rather extensively, lived and worked in Latin America and also in Mexico, where you have you know, a big field of tomatoes and you got the farmer out there spraying all his tomatoes and there's bugs eating the tomatoes and they got to put a bunch of water in and they're weeding them, but you go off to the edge and you see this tomato like growing like 12 feet up into a tree without a single pest on it, nice and beautiful and green, absolutely thriving. These feral plants are, are just thriving under these seemingly um, obscure conditions. Um, these plants have kind of become my teacher and become my inspiration for trying to figure out more passive ways and more minimal input ways to actually be able to produce food. Um, place-based agriculture and the idea of being in a place is something I'm very passionate about. Um, I'm a firm believer that um, regional adaptation is the birth of culture. Um, by adapting to a place, this is what defines what is important to us. By adapting to a place, this defines what we eat, how, uh, what we wear, how we build our homes, how we hold our ceremonies, what foods it is that, you know, are gonna or that are going to comprise our diet. When we really begin to look at what can we produce within a specific region, right, without leveraging the integrity of our region or without leveraging the integrity of other ecological regions to be able to live here, Right, is that we begin to get a very unique expression of, of the place where we are because we are confined by the abundances and the limitations of where we are. Right? And that is what will make us and what has made every culture unique from every other culture is by their specific adaptations to a specific region. So, um, in all of that, um, let's, let's begin, I guess. Um, working at the Native Seed Search Farm, I had the wonderful opportunity to be able to experiment on large scale. Our crop regenerations only needed you know, a certain amount of acreage with the rest of the acreage. So long as I could accomplish what I needed to do for our regenerations, we had the freedom to be able to use some of the rest of the land to play around. So a few years ago, um, realizing that dry farming and floodwater farming has existed here for millennia, we decided to throw some seeds out. Um, literally going out into fields and just chucking seeds around um, in the summers during the monsoon seasons to just see what would grow. Everybody that I asked about this said absolutely not, the climate has changed, you can't be growing things under these conditions, we don't get rainfall like we used to, we don't get flood, the floodplains don't flood like they used to, it's not going to work. Um, and counter to everybody's advice, everything not only worked, it did awesome. It's one of those beautiful plants I've ever seen in my life. Um, so. Yeah, let's dive in. Um, three years ago, I believe it was, um, uh, Paula Shaper here in um, town, just off the edge of the Native Seed Search Farm, opened up one of her valleys for me to be able to start playing around with um, adapting some agricultural systems to our region. So as we begin to look at what would be required and what agriculture looks like when we really start to adapt it, to our region, we really need to start dissolving all of our preconceptions, I guess, about agriculture and a lot of the things that we think about as far as what actually makes plants thrive. Okay, um, let's start with seeds. All right? There's going to be a talk later um, by a dear friend of mine, Pete, who's going to give an introduction to seeds and seed saving and the seed human seed relationship. Um, what I'm going to speak to right now, though, are land races. Seeds are are one of our most critical tools. Um, to, to be able to establish agricultural systems. We have you know, two main options of how we're going to drive subsistence as human beings. One is a more hunter-gatherer nomadic lifestyle and the other is agriculturalists. Um, without seeds, it doesn't matter how much land you have, how much sun you have, how fertile your land is, how much water you have. If you don't have seeds, you have nothing. Um, but seeds and seeds of adapted varieties really are what are critical. Okay, so you could take seeds from other regions of the planet, say you take some corn seed from the Midwest, or bring up some seeds from like the Southlands in the jungle and plant them out here in the desert, chances are they're going to wither and die. It's not always the case, but we have an absolutely extreme set of conditions out here, with May and June being incredibly hot and dry, 
right? And then opening up into our monsoon season where we get our largest abundance of rain. Um, rain being our, you know, our prominent sustainable irrigation source for crops. All right? After that 90 day window, we move into our winter and then in the winter, for as long as I've been here, we end up getting a couple of inches. Traditionally, I think it was a little bit more substantial. Um, but we need to figure out how it is that we can utilize the rain um, to be able to grow our crops. This is based on the understanding that pumping groundwater for agricultural purposes within this region is an inherently unsustainable practice. Okay? I'm not suggesting that people should stop growing food or that we should stop watering gardens right now. Um, you know, we're still learning and relearning how it is that we can actually produce within the confines of our regional abundance. Um, but it should be generally understood that this is what we need to work away from. Because in case nobody else has noticed, our creeks are dropping, our water table's dropping, um, the water table's dropping, our tree roots can't reach into them anymore, and our landscape is desiccating. <clears throat> so, um, a few years ago, we got to open up into a valley. Oh yeah, seeds. That's what I was talking about, sorry. Um, could we go to the next slide? So, land races. Most of the crops that we're working with, all right, we'll go into the next slide actually. Most of the crops that we're working with out here in this ag experimentation are what we refer to as land races. Land races are varieties that have been developed over centuries or over millennia with specific adaptation to a region. Seeds are living, breathing organisms. Plants are living, breathing organisms. All right, every year that you take a crop and you plant it out in a field, you know, a number of pests might come through, a number of, you know, insects, insects might wipe out a handful of crops. Disease might come through, wipe out a handful of your plants. Um, let's take corn, for example, plant out a field of corn. The wind might blow some down. Um, too much rain might rot some out. Not enough rain might desiccate some. And at the end of the season, when you bring that harvest in, what you get is a genetic or a population representation of corn plants, if we're using corn as an example, that are adapted to the regional these specific conditions. All right, when you do that, not just one year, but over 10 years or over 100 years or over 1,000 years, you get a variety that is adapted not just to the region, but to every, or to that year that you're growing it in, but to every stress that's really ever been imposed upon its ancestry. Furthermore, it's not just adapting to your specific climate, but it's also adapting to the agricultural practice that it exists within, All right? There's as many different agricultural practices as there are farmers. Um, and there are as many land races, or were as many land races, as there are farmers also. So, um, what are our crops? Step one in understanding, uh, you know, how we can produce food within the regional, you know, abundances and confines of, of this area is choosing the right crops. Right? Like I said, we have a phenomenal agricultural heritage here, which has produced an amazing amount of crop diversity. Um, you know, our big three are corn, beans, and squash, right? These crops are phenomenally adapted, but furthermore, we have a lot of corn, bean, and squash varieties that come from regions that have more abundance. So the idea would be, first and foremost, to start focusing on seeds that have been birthed out of the cultures from this area, right? That are adapted and pre-adapted to this region. It's not always the case that we need to have seeds that are specifically adapted here. We brought peanuts up from the Sierra Madres that for about 300 years have been grown in conditions that are pretty similar to Phoenix in the bottom of the Copper Canyon. We planted them next to some wild jungle peanuts um, that are grown in the Colombian lowlands in the Amazon. Um, and the ones from the Colombian lowlands actually kicked ass <laughs> over these pre-adapted peanut varieties. So it's not tried and true that we need pre-adapted varieties all, always, but it's a really great place to start. Um, so, our crops. Um, over a number of years, we just started planting things out, just seeing what we could get to work, trialing them in a bunch of different methods. Um, after leaving Native Seed Search, we didn't necessarily have access to flat land, so doing cross-comparative analysis of all these varieties and things like that became very difficult. We moved up into a valley, which is the valley that you saw there, um, and really more focused on just planting seeds in a diversity of different ways just to be able to observe. How do these crops grow? What can we successfully produce? Um, and it was absolutely amazing. Almost everything that we put in the ground <laughs> just kicked butt and grew. Um, up to this point, we've been able to successfully mature um, seed and crops from 
See, this is Chapalote. This is a composite of about 14 different collections of maize from Sinaloa that we've been able to grow out. This we throw in the ground in early April. Um, it sustains two and a half months without a single drop of water, sitting about six inches tall. And then when the monsoons arrive, um, grows to about nine feet tall, all right, and produces a big, healthy, beautiful crop of corn. Go to our next. Um, this is another composite of maize. Um, this is a composite that we were putting together. If you think about our climate here, we have a 90-day window when you have an abundance of rain, you know, from somewhere around the beginning of July until the frosts fall um, at the end of, or somewhere in middle October. All right, that's our window. Um, it's a 90-day window to get seed in the ground. You can't necessarily plant into dry ground. Um, you know, timing is absolutely critical. Um, so what we're really looking for in pre-adaptation for crops here is crops that can mature seed in that 90-day window. These represent some of the fastest maturing crops on planet Earth. Not too many crops will mature seed in 90 days. This is a composite of about 15 different um, maizes that are nice and short and stout um, from uh, Hopi lands, from the Tarahumara, from the Pueblos, um, all mixed together. Mm -hmm. Go to our next one. This is another just reflection. They were all different colors. We really like colors. You know, it's the colors in corn actually make a lot more delicious flavors too. Colored corns are way yummier than white corns. Um, so we're just kind of letting it express itself how we want it to. Go to the next one. Um, millet. All right. This is broadcasted millet. And we threw out this is a finger millet. I'm not a super big fan of the way millet tastes, but we definitely got affirmation that whether it's for biomass production or whether it's for um, actually maturing a grain seed for eating or maybe for chicken feed, that millet performs really, really well in, in this region. Sunflowers, these are some of our dry farm I use plants in the back. These are garbanzo varieties. We first started playing around with them in the winter, went down to Mexico and found out that most of the garbanzos, garbanzos were introduced by the Spanish like 350 years ago or so um, into, into the Mexican area, uh, or into Mexico. Um, but going down south, we found out they plant their garbanzos in the summer with the monsoon rains rather than in the winter. And what we ended up with were big, huge, beautiful garbanzo plants with hundreds of seed pods on them. Um, we're still working on identifying varieties that can mature within that 90-day window because about half the seeds don't actually dry down in time by the time the frost comes and kills it. Um, we have peanuts out here also in the side that we were able to grow with the monsoons. Next slide. These are our peanuts here. These are actually those wild jungle peanuts in the Colombian lowlands that seem to thrive here for some reason. Next. Um, basil. All right. um, this is a little bit of an exception. We didn't direct seed the basil. We started it in pots um, a few weeks earlier, previous to the monsoon, and transplanted. <clears throat> My general assumption um, is that the best way to get a healthy root zone established, and I'll talk about this a little bit more, is by direct seeding and planting with the rain because once you start a plant in a pot is that you're training the roots to be able to receive daily moisture and you know it's confined into that root zone. That its roots are going to be you know, bound within that and that when you transplant it <clears throat> and go into systems where all of a sudden you have two weeks of drought instead of it getting water every day that the plant is already adapted in its early stages of life to just be receiving water every day. But um, contrary to all of our assumptions, they rocked it. Um, these guys all actually spent four weeks without a single drop of water last year within um, the monsoon season and matured seed. Next slide. Um, peppers, same thing, these are transplanted peppers. Yeah. Can I ask a question? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. How long did you seed the basil before you planted it? Um, did you miss that? I think, I believe it was th maybe three weeks old okay, so it before it went in. Okay. You know, right. young little plants. Yeah, all right. Yeah. Um, these are peppers, there's a large diversity of peppers just from peppers that we'd collected from a bunch of different regenerations we did at Native Seed Search, mixed them all together. Um, I'm not even sure what the name varieties are at this point, um, but we planted them out and once again, they just thrived. It's amazing too, is that when you actually allow plants, you don't want to stress plants out, you don't want to stress them out so bad that they're going to die. But when you're not irrigating is that the plants are forced to chase that water down and they end up establishing much stronger root systems and establishing much stronger plants. We had tomato plants uh, volunteer the first time, which is where we got the idea to 
play around with peppers and tomatoes that grew from seed in the monsoon season and grew about three and a half feet tall and they were like little trees. They didn't need trellising. You know, they're strong. They only grew, you know, as large as they could given the resources that they had available. When you start adding more water and more fertility is that they're going to get lanky and large and you're going to need to trellis them out. Um, but both the peppers and the tomatoes sustaining intense monsoon storms are just like, yeah, I'm here. I know how to be here, you know. So, going through. Um, these are some dry farm tomatoes last year. Um, dry farming tomatoes does happen uh, in other regions in the west here. Um, in Northern California, there's quite a bit of it. They start, you know, tomato plants, uh, you know, up to six weeks or two months early, and then they bury the roots really, really far down um, where you get, where you have a high water table. Okay. Um, I wasn't expecting the tomatoes to do as well as they did, but we had big, beautiful tomato bushes. And then also when you have those stresses imposed upon them, really a lot of the flavors and the sweetness come out stronger. These are the most delicious tomatoes I've ever eaten in my life. Next slide. Yeah. They don't look like much. They're a little beaten up, but they were super yummy. Um, this is epazote, which is an awesome uh, plant coming out of Mexico, um, used to mix in with beans. It's eaten all throughout Latin America. It's got a very unique scent and flavor. Um, it also uh, has an inter interesting interaction with uh, beans that help them to be more digestible and help you fart less when you're eating them. Um, this is chia. This is salvia hispanica. Um, there's many chias that we can't grow here. Most of the chias from farther south. Um, at least as far as cultivated chias that you know most people are common with or familiar with that we mix into water and they make the mucilage and uh, we drink to give us energy. Um, this is a chia that we spent three years actually planting out the first year. This came from the Sierra Madres. Right? It's a white seeded chia. Um, the first year that we planted out we got like a teeny tiny pinch of seed. The plants were big and beautiful but the frost came too early and killed the plants. Um, but with that pinch of seed, we planted them out next year. Um, the next year, they matured about 10 days earlier. And last year, um, we were able to pull, I think, two pints of seed. So I'm actually going to be growing this up in southern Oregon and ideally be planting it out again this year so that we can actually start farming it a little bit more on scale. The chia is from farther south. Uh, if you plant them in May, begin flowering in like November. Super long season chias. They don't really work here. So we were super stoked to find um, one family, uh, one Tarahumara family that was still holding on to the seed and happy enough to share it with us. Tulsi basil. Um, these are zucchinis, actually. We put I think seven different of the fastest maturing zucchini varieties that I could find. Uh, we mixed all the seed up and planted them out and just said, you know, what we're looking for are not as it's not a matter of choosing like specifically what it is that we want to eat. It's a matter of throwing out um, as much diversity as we can and then seeing what works. You know, and then from there, once we identify what works, then start adapting like how we cook it or how we eat it, you know, to to you know be able to interact with you know the zucchini. It's not a matter of like, you know, I want to grow this zucchini and how do I modify my climate and how do I modify the conditions to be able to grow it. It's let's see what works and then make our food choices and our crop growing choices based on what is actually going to be adapted to grow under these conditions. So they've mixed all together. I just saw one of the zucchinis grown from last year that we grew out until it was large enough, you know, and it develops a hard cascara, a hard uh, um, skin on it. And it's like storing better than any of our other long season storage squashes. Um, just saw it this morning, actually, those harvested last October, so. Um, next slide. Um, this is buckwheat. Um, same thing. Um, you know, it took us a number of years. Buckwheat's pollen is super sensitive um, to heat. Um, it's more adapted for cooler, you know, grayer, cloudier climates. Um, so the first year that we broadcasted it out, we planted about a half an acre, broadcasted it just through straw. And we went out with like four kids and just danced it through the fields. Um, and maybe like, you know, one or two seeds were actually developing on each plant. Um, but with consecutive years of planting is that those seeds that did survive were reflecting, you know, genetic pre-adaptation to heat tolerance. And so once we save those and plant them out as that we're getting increased seed production each year and until now we can actually, we have, I mean, it's just three years. Um, we're actually able to mature buckwheat seed, um, you know, fully mature plants with fully mature seeds on them. Um, maize, right? this is the dry farm maize also. This is again, that composite of about 13 different varieties of um, some of the most drought tolerant maizes from the Southwestern region. 
garbanzos. Again, these are winter garbanzos. This is phenomenal. This is from a February planting. Um, after we planted it, we got one rain with like, a, I think about a quarter inch and we'd had maybe two inches of rain over the winter that year. This was back in 2012, I believe. Um, and it was so awesome to see them like growing up and they were about this big and then like no rain was coming. And it was the first year we were playing around with it. And I was like, well, oh, that's fine. Like at least they sprouted. So we know that like next year, maybe we can modify the planting time. But as like the dry season continued and it got hotter and drier, it was like, they're going to die. And then they just kept getting a little bit bigger. And it was like, well, they grew a little bigger, but they're not going to flower. And then they flowered. And, you know, a month later, they're just sitting and just slowly pushing along until they started maturing seed. Um, yeah. But we did find that, you know, whereas we might get, you know, 30 pods off of a plant here, when we plant garbanzos out in the monsoon season, um, we're getting hundreds of pods on each individual plant. Um, so that's kind of just, you know, we want to make our decisions of what to plant when based on when those plants are going to thrive the best. So I wouldn't necessarily even bother with trying to overwinter garbanzos here anymore. So. Um, I'll just go over a quick list too of some of the other crops. I don't have pictures of all of them, but that we have been able to mature uh, seed from in non-irrigated systems out here. Um, okay. Corn, beans, squash, peppers, tomatoes, garbanzos, wheat, rye, oats, spinach, radish, potatoes, sunflower, chia. We didn't actually get seed off the spinach, but we did get a good spinach harvest. Um, sunflowers, chia, basil, tulsi, spilanthes, lettuce, garlic, bunching onions, buckwheat, sorghum, millet, cowpeas, tepary beans, epasote, peanuts, and panic grass are uh, what we've been able to play around with. So all I'm trying to do with this list is just encourage people, you know, it's not necessarily that we can be producing on scale quite yet or that we have these systems figured out, but we have been able to successfully mature these crops and know that it is possible, you know, so this is kind of serving as our foundation to be able to move forward a little bit more. But seeds, you know, seeds are the foundation, making the right crop choice for what grows here. Wheat, um, you know, we dry farmed wheat in the summer. We played around with dry farming wheat in the winter. Um, the summer dry farmed wheat, we ran a combine over it. We maybe got about 300 pounds an acre. The first corn trial that we did with some uh, maize from the Pima peoples, um, as we weighed out the individual plants, we had a stand of about 1,000 plants, weighed them out. We found out that our yield would have been equivalent to close to 3,000 pounds an acre with an 8-inch rainfall, um, which still doesn't quite make sense to me how we can get um, yield so high with such limited resources. Um, but then that begs to, then we would ask the question, does it make sense even to grow wheat here um, when corn is much more adapted and when our yields are going to be much higher under the same conditions? Um, it would take about two acre feet to get about, you know, 2,000 pounds of wheat per acre um, in another growing season. So we need to think about choosing our, choosing the crops that are best adapted here and then adapting further our diets based on what's really going to thrive under the conditions here. So. Um, when thinking about dry farming out here, we need to think first about site location. Where does it make sense to grow? Okay. Um, step one, uh, I would say that um, a big thing to take into consideration is it's very rare that you encounter an agricultural landscape that's more diverse, more biologically diverse than native landscapes surrounding it. Okay, it's a big struggle and it's what we'd really like to be able to work towards is how do we find the integration of agriculture and ecology to create incredibly diverse agricultural systems that are producing food both for us that are nourishing us and also nourishing the rest of the ecological system. So don't go into a place and tear out a highly diverse ecological system so that you can replace it with one or two crops to plant there. Um, we make our decisions on where to plant out here based on ideally um, working with degraded landscapes. You know, this site out here, right in the back, you've got, you know, nice diversity of native grasses, predominantly sacatone out there. This here is a site that a former farm manager of Native Seed Search had gone out. He was intending on starting a little bit, far, a little farm out there, worked it up, but then had to leave town for other reasons. And so after the soil was disturbed, a succession of predominantly amaranths, mustards, lamb's quarters, and sunflowers came through, um, creating a pretty monotypic stand actually, um, and choking out the growth of other things trying to come in there. So, you know, start with the degraded landscape. The other thing is think about your soil conditions too. Um, you know, we want to decide where to grow based on, you know, where they're going to be most productive. So if you start trying to plant or build a garden on a mountaintop, you're going to be putting a lot more work into building the soil up and moving all these rocks and like getting your garden beds built and the water moisture, the moisture holding capacity is not going to be very strong. 
But down in a valley bottom, you've got concentrations of water flowing through like a river. You know, when the monsoon season comes, you've got really thick, awesome, or really deep topsoil. Um, so let's start where the topsoil is going to be really nice also. So around here, it's the floodplains, you know, but don't go in and rip out native grasses. Floodplains have already pre-degraded sites, I think, are ideal for where we could think about dry farming crops. Um, the valley bottoms and some of the arroyos, all right, if there's already disturbance in there or spots that have been thoroughly messed up by cattle are ideal sites to, like, get the cattle out and start, um, you know, growing a larger diversity of crops. Um, and then the washes, too. Um, a, an unnamed group of people have gone out and actually planted in some of the washes in the sand um, over the winter when they're not flooding. It's where a lot of water is consolidated. It's solid sand. You have no weed growth. All you have to do is plant seeds and come back and harvest. It's really no work. You eliminate a lot of the unnecessary work that happens in agriculture, um, which is around weeding and watering. Okay? So this is a beautiful valley bottom site. Um, we didn't tear out any of the native grasses in this area. We utilized the amaranth uh, stalks out here and the sunflower stalks as our mulch source to keep the soil covered. Um, and then also think about all of this drainage out here that's, you know, this miniature watershed is coming through and filling up this area and generally the water is running off and running through. You get the next. Um, this is a site during the first monsoon, right? This is anywhere from like one to six inches of water in different spots just flowing through the site and running off, then going off and flooding the native seed search fields where it's generally unwanted and then eventually going down into the washes, okay? Um, but seeing this water flowing through is like, cool. You know, we're at a bare minimum of the actual, you know, possibility for being able to produce crops, you know, with, and, you know, anywhere from like eight to 14 inches of rain is what we've been catching in these sites. Um, so if you get an excess of water also coming through and you have the capacity to be able to slow that down, spread it out and sink it in on your site, is it that, you know, eight inches or 10 inches of water is all of a sudden becoming, you know, an extra six inches of water if you can back it up and slow it down um, to be able to help those crops grow. Okay. Um, timing um, is of the utmost importance. Um, so this is that same site. Okay. Um, timing around when you plant and when you do earthworks is critical. As you know, like we get incredibly hot, dry parts of the year when the soil is like so hard that you can barely move it, right? Um, this is actually a small subsection and there'll be a bigger field. I didn't format my pictures very well, so they shrunk up. Um, but this whole site, before the first year of planting out there, I spent a total of three and a half days digging out all of these beds. Um, I wouldn't necessarily ever make sunken beds again in this way because um, some of the most amazing and fertile soil is sitting at the top couple of inches of the soil. And I thought, well, I want to concentrate the water there, but I also removed a lot of the fertility in the organic material um, by digging that sunken bed and put them up into the paths. Um, but what we did here, this is just myself going through with a shovel trying to make lines along contour to be able to, when that river is coming through, slow that water down, concentrate it to where the plants are, and all the mulch that you see here is just a byproduct of the amaranth and the sunflower stalks that had developed over the years. We didn't bring anything in from outside the site the first year. The idea was around, like, what can we just do with hand tools and seeds in a field to be able to actually grow crops? Um, so. So timing um, is a huge thing. If I were to try and do the same work in the middle of May, when you can barely get a shovel two inches into the same soil, it would have taken me you know, half of the year to try and dig out that same, same bed layout. Whereas going in when the moisture is there in the soil, not too wet, not too dry, um, it's also, I have an awesome opportunity when I've been working in these fields that you know, I don't work a nine to five. And so when the soil moisture is right, I can be out there and then work odd jobs in the meantime when the soil moisture is not right to work. Um, but timing is critical to actually be able to, you know, make these things easy and practical so we're not running ourselves into the ground. Um, so, let's see, key things um, with the maintenance of healthy soil in any agricultural system is we have these ideals around no-till and perennial soil cover. They're very rarely ever embodied. Um, I'm continually seeking these things out on farms. A lot of largest proponents do for, you know, for um, no-till, perennial cover, you actually get out there and it's like, oh, but you still disturb the soil continually. Big thing with soil disturbance, um, well, I'll get to that in a moment. But um, what we're working for towards is if we're going to go in and disturb soils, make one disturbance. Disturb the soil enough 
that you can get your weed profile under control if that's what you need, that you can do your earthwork so that you never have to do it again. All right? And if that means waiting a year before you plant, spend the year getting the site ready because if you just dive in with plants and then all of a sudden you've got weeds coming up and you need to do earthworks later, you're caught in this cycle of just putting out fires and trying to get stuff done um, or trying, you know, trying to smother the weeds and so on and so forth around your crops. Whereas if you can actually spend the time preparing a site slowly and then go in and plant when it's ready, then you're going to be eliminating a lot of your unnecessary work because a lot of the problems that we deal with in agriculture come as a byproduct of the heavy disturbances that we cause to the soil and the ecology responding to that. So, um, you know, these are our paths here and these are our beds, just backfilled them with straw. Next slide. Um, so, mulch. Minimizing soil disturbance, okay, critical. The idea is that um, soil and healthy soil is a byproduct of an incredible diversity of micro and macro biological organisms interacting in the soil. When you give the soil time to sit, which almost all native soils anywhere, you very rarely get soil disturbances, ideally. Um, in native landscapes, you have a generally, ideally, a perennial soil cover, whether it's through um, you know, a biological crust or actual, you know, organic material sitting on the surface and you don't have disturbances. That means that there's all these little insects and bugs and microorganisms creating all these holes and tunnels that allow atmospheric gases, that allow penetration for water. If the soil's too compacted or if those tunnels don't exist, more water runs off, all right? So we're trying to limit soil disturbance and create a cover. So where do we get our mulch? In that case, we had amaranth stalks that were right there that were sufficient. Um, or you can grow your own. There's a field of, this is on the native seed search farm, this is a field of buckwheat, millet, um, a little bit of rye, and some sorghum. We just broadcasted it out there. The idea is that during the monsoon season, broadcast seed out there, let it grow up, and then lay it down, and next year go in and plant. With regards to weeds, um, the majority of the weeds that we're dealing with here, Johnson grass, bindweed, and the Bermuda grass is the exception. Yeah, no way. <laughs> um, that um, per, once you have a cover over the soil, these things don't grow. You know, people are continually complaining about, oh, there's all these weeds growing and so on and so forth. Well, it's like cover your soil. 100% weed suppression of most of your broadleaf weeds can happen if you just put one inch of cover over the soil. All right, solid cover. The amaranths don't grow. The lamb's quarters don't grow. The mustards don't grow. All right, there's some of the grasses. The grasses are the exception. But that's another big thing in choosing a site too. Choose a site where you're not dealing with really hardcore perennial weeds. Um, how to deal with those weeds is another conversation that if anyone wants to engage in afterwards, I'd, I'd be happy to. Um, but if you're going into a site where what you have is broadleaf weeds, all you have to do is cover the soil and they will not grow. And you eliminate the, one of the largest labor inputs to an agricultural practice, which is weeding. So grow your own mulch, you know, let it grow up. Ideally, we want to be using what we have available to us to be able to add fertility to the soil, add mulch to the soil. If we're drawing organic material from other areas, that means that we're also leveraging the integrity of another ecological system. Straw, um, you know, if you're pulling straw from farms that are using irrigation to be able to, you know, raise biomass, that biomass should stay on those farms. What are we doing taking straw bales from another place and then bringing them over here, you know, using pumped groundwater to produce straw and then ship it over here. Just be a little more patient, throw some seeds out, grow up your biomass, lay it down, and then next year go in and plant. Right. And then fertility. You know? um, cover cropping is amazing. Um, throw seeds out, ideally, you know, a mixture of grains and legumes to produce biomass, leguminous plants, fix nitrogen. One of our largest nitrogen inputs also comes from rainwater. You know, the lightning strikes up in, you know, up in the sky are infusing the water with um, atmospheric nitrogen and coming down. Um, and, but um, also look to unutilized resources. This is actually down in Chihuahua. This is going out after, uh, after a flood, this peat here. And with our friend Lupe in the bottom of the Copper Canyon digging up um, debris, duff debris that have come from, you know, from the washes that are in the river bottom. If the next flood comes through, it's going to wash it further downstream. It's going to neutrify the water too and potentially create other problems. So we go in and we, you know, go down into the washes. If it's right there in the middle of the washes, go ahead and, you know, dig some up and bring it up to your field and lay it down in the, you know, the ground. These are super nutrient dense 
um, um, sources of fertility for, for your fields because it's a reflection of everything that's running off of the mountains, especially in these degraded landscapes. Now we have so much nutrient runoff and so much organic material ending being deposited in the washes. So let's go in and take it and bring it back up higher into the system. This is an example of the weed suppression. So in here, these are the sunken beds with the amaranth mulch, all right? And this is where it's not covered. Most of the weeds are responding to exposed soils. These are our pioneer plants. They're incredible biomass producers, and a lot of people complain about them, but they're incredible biomass producers. They're highly adapted to produce a lot of biomass under limited conditions. And if the soil is exposed, by all means, let them grow. Because what they're trying to do is cover the soil up. Exposed soil is like a wound across this land, and weeds are, are there like a scab to cover it up. So until you can actually cover the soil up, let those weeds grow up, and they themselves will produce enough biomass to cover it up. 100, just, you know, there's a few spaces here, but generally speaking, this is 100% weed suppression in those beds. And in the exposed paths, we let those grow up until they were as big as, as you know, before, uh, as big as possible before they flowered, and then we pulled them up and laid them down and mulched the beds. Now there's no more weeds in that garden. Earthworks, right? Earthworks for consolidating waters and spreading it out, slowing it down, sinking it in. Same thing with, you know, restoration principles out here in the desert. We went farther up the valley. There's about two acres here. These are mostly the degraded sites, left all of our native grasses, and then dug swales along the lines of contour so that when that flood, when those flood waters came through, we could back the water up, sink it in, and allow more water to go to the crops and to also the native grasses that we wanted to be able to um, utilize for producing more biomass. The sacatone also intermixed in the fields, awesome source of biomass for mulch. Let them grow up, go through, whack them back, take that mulch and lay them right next to the, to the beds there. We don't need to eliminate all these you know, native plants uh, within our agricultural fields. You know, let's interact with them and let's utilize them. They're amazing biomass producers. So these are lines, uh, long contours, so that when these floodwaters came through, is that they would back up and concentrate more water there. Okay, these are those fields when those floodwaters came through. Previously, that water would run all the way off. We haven't stopped it 100%, but we were able to consolidate a significantly more amount of water um, in those fields. Okay, this was compacted. They built a road through there. Um, we dug some swales along the edges of the road also to be able to consolidate the water that's running off of the road itself. Um, and then in there, we got some uh, awesome native plants from Borderlands and went through and planted at the right time. It's another planting th or another timing thing is that we went in after the first rains when there was soil moisture there, put the plants in the ground. Um, of the 30 plants that we put in, we had about an 80% success rate um, throughout the first year, and then we've had a couple die since then. The field's been out there, you know, for a couple years, um, but went through and covered them up. Okay, same thing, consolidating water. Let's consolidate water. Let's keep it in the field. Let's keep it from running off the sites that we're working in. Okay, go through more in a loop. Pests, okay. Um, this whole timing thing. Um, the idea of regionally adapted agriculture um, with, regard, sorry, the, with regards to pests and pest presence is that when you, when you the continual complaint out here um, with regards to agriculture, too much heat, too many pests. We have 3,000 years of coevolution of crop pests out here with agriculture. Like every crop pest I've ever had to deal with is present here. It's wild. But if you're in May and June and you have an irrigated field and the rest of the landscape is absolutely desic desiccated, and all of a sudden you have these plants that are bright and green and healthy looking, you know, that's an amazing food source for everything around that's looking to eat. But when you plant, accordingly to the cycles of, 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 of abundance within this area is that you are creating green and life when everything else is also creating green and life. So these things are much less noticeable. This is a squash bug um, actually being strangled by the pentacle on a squash plant. I'm not sure how uh, that came to be. Um, but, you know, as far as my philosophy on um, dealing with pests is just plant within the cycles and you really don't have these issues. Plant the crops that are adapted here. The grasshoppers, what do you do about the grasshoppers? Well, when the grasshoppers come through our field, all of our staple crops are on their way to drying down. They eat all of the leaves off of our corn plants, they rapidly accelerate their dry down process, and they dry it down even faster, which is great. And then you can go through and eat the grasshoppers. They're not super delicious, but they're an awesome protein source out here and rather sustainably harvestable. 
Okay. Um, you know, another big thing too is also just diversity within the fields. Planting as much diversity of flowering plants, well-scented plants, to try and mask your plants and hide them a little bit more. Um, but like I said, when you're planting within those cycles of abundance, we really don't have pests. And if some of our plants die, like that's okay. And some things get attacked a little bit more than others. But when you plant within the cycles, you're creating abundance amongst abundance. And there's enough food for everything. You know? um, wild crafting. Okay, the all 100% farm-based diet is a very new thing to humanity. Right? Um, you look at traditional agricultural systems everywhere. Most agriculture is dedicated to the production of staple crops and the, what brings the unique flavors and spices and also the micronutrients to your diet are the wild crafts. We have the phenomenal abundance of native plants here to be able to consume. You know, there's still in, in, this, um, you know, in this country and in our conservation methodology too is that we generally isolate our conservation areas where they're just to like to look at and to observe and to experience the beauty and to walk through. But we also have to remember that a lot of these landscapes co-evolved with human interaction and that we can actually have a beneficial interaction with our native landscapes through, you know, through consuming the food. Even going out and harvesting saguaro, you know, going out and pooping out the saguaro and building a rock stack on it and maybe few years down the road you might get a little saguaro popping up there you know um, but we have an amazing abundance of of wild crafts out here that in quantity whether it be the the saguaros whether it be the barrel cactus fruits the nopale pads these are absolutely delicious um, and we should be encouraging their proliferation within the native landscape also you know we can have a beneficial impact go out stack up some rocks you know as you're out there you don't need to just go walk and hike and observe like take an extra five minutes and like, oh, that's an awesome Nopale. Let me, you know, cut a pad off that and put some rocks over here and spread it out over here a little bit. Proliferate these things, you know? So, you know, let's not solely look for our food sources just to be from our farm. Let's interact with our native landscapes. Be conscious and considerate. Don't have a purely extraction mentality, but see how you can be able to interact with the native landscapes, consume and also proliferate their presence out there. So we go out for five days, you know, before the monsoons, harvest saguaro in the hottest, driest time of the year. That heat pushes up the moisture and then the monsoons come, the saguaro harvest ends. And when those first rains come, then we go out and we plant our fields. Okay, barrel cactus fruits, not super yummy. The seeds toasted are. Um, mushrooms, all right, this is Lepiota procera. Um, this is the true parasol mushroom. The only place that it exists west of the Rockies is right here in southeastern Arizona. Came across it totally by accident, looked it up, and then everyone's like, they don't exist around here. Got it keyed out. It's most, one of the most delicious mushrooms on planet Earth. Okay, this is the scale of how large these things are. <laughs> All right? You can smell them when you're walking past them. All right, these are, this is a small, my picture's not here, but Boletus bicolor, Boletus crescenteron, the puffballs that pop up around here. They're not here every year, but when they're here, they're here in abundance. Harvest them, pull spores off them, spread the spores out in as many places as you can to proliferate, you know, the existence of, of you know, of the ectomycorrhizal fungi and the saprophytic mushrooms that are out here. They play a critical role in the landscape too. So, you know, be aware that there's so many other forms of, of life that we can be interacting with for our foodstuffs. Just, just go two more. Just round it out. I'm sorry, whoever's time I'm taking up. Um, so the last thing that I want to bring up is around art and ceremony. All right? Have fun with all of this, too. We don't need to have these generic agricultural landscapes. When you eliminate the use of irrigation also for, um, you know, for agricultural purposes is that you don't need to have things in, line, in lines anymore. Have fun. Express it. Give some edges. This is a small seed of life garden that we built because if it's just dependent on the rain, it doesn't matter you know, what shape your garden is. Let the landscape define the shape and then let your heart define the shape. You know, these are, this is the triple infinity uh, medicine wheel gardens down in the bottom of the Copper Canyon. These we ended up putting radial sprinklers on, um, but we utilized the high abundance of rain that was there in the winter too um, to grow open pollinated seed crops in the Copper Canyon. Yeah, and then ceremony. You know, create ceremony based on your own interaction with the landscape. We don't need to appropriate ceremonies from other cultures all right, is that you can have your own individual interaction with the area that you're in. The birth of ceremony and the birth of culture is through interacting with the landscapes. What do you hold sacred to you? You know, what do you hold special to you? And create ceremony around it. 
You know, I believe strongly that prayer and song and dance and all these things have an incredibly beneficial impact both on the landscape and on the plants. They respond to those things. And if you don't want to think about it in energetic terms, just the reality of paying attention in that way, in a different way than you're just going out in your field to weed or to harvest. But when you step back, you know, and start to celebrate some of the things out there is that it draws a different type of attention to the field and you also begin to notice different things because you're looking through a different lens at a lot of these things. So let's build our ceremonies. Let's build our own, you know, ceremony and our, and our own relationship with the land that we have around us based on our own individual interaction with it. You know? So, in conclusion, um, we still have a lot to figure out. I don't want to pretend, you know, by any means that we have got dry farming figured out here. I just want to try and encourage people that it is possible, that it's a worthwhile thing to be working towards because if we truly care about the landscape and the region that we were in, then we should really learn to be here and stop leveraging the integrity of other cultures, of other social systems, of other ecologies from other regions so that we can protect where we are here. Let's figure out how to conserve and proliferate biodiversity within this region while actually living here. Thank you very much.